Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go! Today on the show is Richard Shulman. Richard consistently is ranked top five for Keller Williams top producing agents. Last year, he did $54 million in sales. In addition to that, he teaches real estate courses at UCLA and is a frequent contributor to media outlets like Forbes Magazine and CBS. Richard, thanks for taking the time out today. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. Sure. So I've given a brief background, but maybe take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, I've been doing this uh, nine years now, nine and a half years. I started at Prudential in 2004, sort of right right as things were chugging along and the real estate boom going up. Um, I switched to Keller Williams Realty right as things were starting to go down in 2007. And uh, since that time in 2007, I've worked on building a team. And we've been building our team based on not a geographic farm, which a lot of agents do, but we're doing sort of a social media internet-based farm which is our business model, we think, is the, the new way that people are going to work in real estate businesses. That is great. I, and I want to get into that a lot later in the show. Um, but, you know, before, you know, what did you do before you started your current company? I was a painting contractor for two years while I was in college. And uh, this is basically my first job. I started when I was 24. Unbelievable. So is, it, is that like college painters or, or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, I went to UCSD and I did the same thing. It was back then. It was called. Um, this is like early '90s, but that was it was called uh, student painters. And I'll tell you something. Yeah. That experience taught me a ton. Um, it taught me, you know, you go to door to door and you knock on doors and say, "Hey, can I give you a free estimate?" And that really honed my my sales skills. I'm sure. I'm sure it did the same for you. Oh yeah, same thing. Not door knocking. You know, running a small business, um, lead generation and lead follow up, and. Uh, you know, exact same principles that you put to work in real estate and probably any other small business. So uh, if you make it in the painting business, then I think you can do anything else. There you go. But it's, it's a tough gig. A lot of people don't make it. So for you in real estate, you know, what do you think the biggest hurdle real estate entrepreneurs have to overcome? Um, I think if, if you're a new agent, the biggest hurdle is just getting established. You know, when you, when you start your job, let's say today you get your license, I'm a real estate agent. Well, you got to go find a client then you got to actually convert that client into buying a property and then closing the property and then getting paid. So, I mean, even if you were really lucky, it would probably take three or four months to get paid. Um, and then you've got to do it again and again because you have bills to pay. So I think the biggest hurdle is getting established, you know, getting into a rhythm where you can produce five, six, seven sales in your first year and then find a way to grow from there. So once you can kind of get established, pay your bills, feel comfortable, um, in the business, I think that, and then you can worry about other problems. But that's definitely the, the hardest challenge that I see. So how do you do that? So, you know, you have a new agent, they're getting going, um, or somebody who, who's been at it for a while. You know, how do you, how do you get established and, and plant, plant those roots? Uh, when I do training, what I talk to people about is you want to have two or three types of lead generation. A lot of times people will, you know, go on the courses, they'll go online, they'll read the books, and they'll want to do 10, 12 different things. Um, I tell people find two things that you're really good at. One of those is going to be your sphere of influence, so your friends, family, um, previous coworkers, that type of thing. Um, that should be your main source of business to start out with because those are the only people who will trust you and you're a new agent to help with them. Um, then you're going to have to find something else, open houses, door knocking, Fizbo's expired, something like that. And then maybe if, if you have the time to do a third one that's just, you know, sort of maybe you do, you know, expired and Fizbo's or maybe you do open houses and expired calls. So certainly you're going to start with your sphere of influence. Um, what would you yeah. think, you know, so you got expired or Fizbo's. Um, if I came to you, I mean, and I said, hey, Richard, would you tell me where, right? So give me a shove, right? Um, uh, I'll tell you, for me, I've heard from a lot of very successful people that, you know, when you're trying to get established, it's open houses, uh, that you should do two open houses uh, every week. Um, would you, mm-hmm. are you leaning towards that way or would you say expires or fizzbos? Well, you know, you know, what's really important is something that you feel not only comfortable with, but something that you're going to succeed at. 
I started out doing a lot of open houses, and I really wasn't that good at it. I did a lot of open houses and had, I think, one sale my first year from doing probably 50 open houses, like literally every weekend. And I should have taken it as a hint that I needed to retrain on how to do open houses. So now if I do one, I can do a lot better. But it's something you have to know, you have to be good at what you're doing. So if you're a very extroverted social person, um, open houses can be really good. If you're not as extroverted or social, you might want to look at maybe doing expired or FISBO, something a little more you know, routine, like wake up in the morning, you know, get a list of numbers to call and call those numbers. But the most important thing is something that you have to really feel that you're going to do well at because it's, you, know, you have to really commit yourself as far as time to do these things. Yeah, that's great. So for you, I mean, you, you are definitely super successful, $54 million, and you're, you, you've been, I looked at your resume or um, your website, and uh, since 07, you've been killing it every year. You know, for you, was, was there ever a time that you felt like it was just too hard and you wanted to quit? And, and how did you push through that roadblock and find success? Um, well, there, there was a couple times when I first started. Um, I remember one time, and I, I use this story when I talk to new agents, is I, I came in and to my, my trainer, my manager, and I said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, and, you know, I'm sitting around. I have no idea what to do because, you know, the training just wasn't there. They didn't say, well, you know, while you're not doing open houses Monday through Friday, you need to be doing this. I really was sort of lost. She, she, you know, the manager fired me, and I got really upset, and she said, you know, you can come work here, but you have to, you know, work this many hours a week, a day. Just come to work and make phone calls and emails, and it sort of, you know, kicked me into gear. Um, so that was, that was sort of a big moment, and then I was really about to quit. I was doing this about nine months before I made my first sale, and it was... Uh, wow sort of a grind and this was 2004 and people were just selling houses left and right and here I was you know 23 24 years old uh, no idea what I was doing and ev- everyone else was making money and I was just sort of floundering so I uh, made that first sale that really got me over the hump that's amazing so I mean 04 was gangbusters um, yeah uh, and you it took you nine months to make one sale I mean what were you doing yeah. wrong uh, I don't know if that's what I was doing wrong. I don't, you know, I don't really remember vividly what I was doing, but I, I didn't have a big database of clients. You know, I certainly, you know, what I would tell, what I would tell people now what to do was what I wasn't doing is monetize your sphere of influence. You know, make a systematic plan to attack your sphere of influence because I was being shy. I wasn't telling my friends and family what I was doing, and then I'm finding out that they're buying properties, not knowing that I was in the business. Mm-hmm. So that was a problem. I didn't have market knowledge. So as a 23-year-old kid, I had no idea what I was doing, and so I'm not adding any value to anyone's experience. And that's, that's another big point I talk about when I, when I work with agents. So they say, you know, they're not hiring you because you have a super key, you know, which is an electronic key box to open doors. They're hiring you because they want market knowledge and experience and advice. Um, you know, so I didn't have any of that to offer. So I was just sort of floundering around, and it just took me a while to sort of figure out how everything worked. Man. Um, so you were not monetizing your sphere of influence and you were not going out and getting that, uh, that market knowledge. You know, what do you think, you know, on average, what do you think the single biggest thing that most realtors get wrong? Um, well, I, I think, I think those two are sort of the real keys. You know, if you're, if you're an agent and you don't know what's going on in the market and I don't he says, well, you know, prices were up this many percent down to the, you know, the de- decimal level and, you know, right. inventory is this. You don't need to have that level of knowledge because I don't think people need to hear that, you know, prices are up 1.2% over May or over last year or whatever the, the number is. I think people want to know that you're, you're very conversant about what's going on in the marketplace today. Um, there's different types of properties. They want to know, you know, why one property type, let's say in our market, Entry level or mid level house might get ten offers, while an entry level condo might not get any offers right now. So they want to understand why. So you need to be able to talk about that. And I think a lot of agents don't really have a good perspective on what's happening in the general economy. And I think that your smarter clients and wealthier clients are going to want to know what your thoughts are. You know, hey, there's a shutdown. How's that going to affect my buying a home or my loan or me selling my home? Right. And so you need to be able to talk about not only your local market but the whole economy. Right, and that shutdown, and, and by the way, for everybody in the audience, this is October 2012, so uh, it, in case you're listening to this in 2020, but uh, right now, we, our government is shut down, so that's what, that's what uh, Richard was referring to. Um, so for you, um, you, know, y- y- you at some point learned to monetize your sphere of influence. Uh, you, you started to gain market knowledge. Tell us about your first breakthrough deal, that first aha moment that you had. Um. Well, it, it was very quick. You know, I mentioned it took me nine months. My first sale 
was we had floor time, which I don't think really happens anymore, but floor times were, you know, the, the signs on the houses had the general office line and the new agents answer those calls. So that was sort of a, an old vestige of how things were done. But it was just sort of a breakthrough that I went there and I, I you know, made this personal connection and I navigated the sale really well for the client. Even though I really didn't know what I was doing, uh, I knew the listing agent and I was able to basically friend, friend, make friends with the listing agent and get them to accept my client's offer and get it closed you know, with my mentor helping me. Um, so that was sort of a really big breakthrough as far as you know, this is how you need to do it. Is, Show up, smile, wear a tie, talk to the. Oh, that, that was I know, that was the first, that was really the first time I wore a tie to work. Um, but show up, dress nicely, answer the questions, and then really you know really grind it out with the seller's agent to try to get your deal accepted. Um, and then from there, everything sort of started moving very quickly. Uh, sold a fourplex, listed and sold a house, sold an expensive condo. So things really uh, moved very quickly right after that. So, so you mentioned something interesting there to me. So. Uh uh, you you said you had a mentor at this time. Uh, at, yeah. at what point did you get that mentor? Uh, well, that was the mentor that we were given ah. um, when we when we came on. But it wasn't. It was you know we had weekly thirty minute training was basically our all of our training, and the mentor was basically there to supervise our deals with us. It was sort of deal based mentorship, not how to get to a deal. Got you. Do do you have a regular mentor now or no? Um, right, yeah, right now I have a couple people that I talk to on a regular basis. Um, so you, some people would call it coaching or mentorship or something like that. I have two or three people who I, I talk to on a regular basis about, well, what we're doing. Not so much accountability, but sort of ideas and where to go next. How helpful is that to you? Um, oh, it's really helpful. I mean, you can't, you know, if, if you're focused on your business, it's really hard to take a step back and see what am I doing right, what am I doing wrong. And then you also want to know, you know, like we have a team now and we have buyer's agents and our buyer's agents have showing assistants who work for them. And so sort of generating that model, you know, something that really came to us from outside coaching at the Keller Williams uh, Family Reunion and Mega Camp where they sort of are pitching this idea of, you know, leveraging your team to create a great experience for your clients. Leveraging your team to create a great experience. How, tell, tell me, give me an example of that, how you leverage your team. So the, 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 we do a lot of buyer work with the number one buyer's agents in LA County right now by a transaction count. And the way that we do that is um, we have a very large sales staff. And the idea is not that we're, we're calling the clients and yelling at them to buy houses. The idea is that we're letting clients know, hey, here's houses that are going to match what you're looking for. And because you hired a team, you're not a solo agent, not a partnership, because we have, I think, seven licensed salespeople on the team, we're always available to show you the home. So if you want to see the house, you know, 7 o'clock at night, 8 o'clock in the morning, someone will always be available to show it to you. Because people work. You know, if your clients, most of your clients are working 9 to 5, 9 to 6, and they got to drive home from work, you know, they can't necessarily see a house at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So making ourselves available to the clients is a really big step in getting them into more homes, and then once they're in more homes, they can write more offers. Right, okay. What do you, what do you know now that you wish you would have known when you started? <laughs> How long is the interview? <laughs> <laughs> well, just give it the um, one. That's a good. You know, I think I think there's a few things. I mean, sort of. Um, I, I wish I'd read the MREA book, which is the Keller Williams Real Estate book. Um, not because I would have started a team from day one. And I always tell people that's not a good idea. But just so I'd started a team sooner, I probably could have started my team two or three years earlier. Um, you know, that's that's a big one. I think. I think just talking you know, about how do you look at this really as a business, that's, that's the KW perspective is what's, you know, what are you? Are you a real estate salesperson or do you run a real estate sales business? Mm. And the idea is that you know, we want to run a business that's efficient for us and it's efficient and productive for our clients. So um, you know, I wish I knew, knew more about you know, systematic database. You know, I used to just you know, call clients randomly. Now I have a top producer that helps me um, connect with clients on a regular basis. So if, if you tell me, call me November 5th, I will call you on November 5th. Um, so those are probably the big things, really focusing on how to run this as a business, not, not just so that I can make more or my team can make more, but it really helps the customer experience, and people get a better result in that way. Got it. Okay. Um, how do you personally stay productive and focused on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, I, you, know, you, you have to just be focused on your goals. So what are our goals? What do we want from our goals? Um, we call it the big why. You know, 
okay, so we go to work to make money. What do you do with the money? You know, money is not the end. Money is a means to do something. And what do you want to do with that money? Um, for me, you know, spending time with my family, is like if I can earn enough that I can, you know, spend time with my family or provide for them. And that's really, you know, all the motivation I need. Um, well, so t- talk to me about some of your daily routines. Do you have a daily routine? I mean, earlier you mentioned, uh, you know, for that person starting out, you know, they might uh, wake up, uh, make phone calls. I mean, do, do, you, do you have a personal daily routine? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, every day is different, every day changes, but um, generally I don't, I don't do too many morning meetings because it's really important to me. Wake up in the morning, I do all my email lead generation in the morning, and I also want to go through my inbox, make sure we keep it, we, have, we call it inbox zero on the team, make sure that all my items are taken care of. Um, I also want to check on all my offers first thing in the morning, just because we know that offer follow-up is crucial to success for our clients. So that's probably usually from, let's say, 8 to 9 or 10, and then after that, I'll usually have meetings in the middle of the day or in the later afternoon. So usually middle of the day, I'll go out for showings or meetings. Um, I try to do a lot of lunch meetings with people. It's very productive to uh, get referrals and to uh, solidify relationships. Um, then in the afternoon, I do the gym. So, you know, staying, staying active and healthy is really important to this type of business. Um, and then, you know, later in the afternoon or early evening, I'll do some more lead follow-up with phone calls. You know, people who are, you know, working, you know, regular nine-to-five jobs who I can't necessarily call during the day, I'll call them at that time. And then also at the end of the day or late afternoon, I'll go through the offers again, make sure we've made all our offer follow-ups. Awesome. That was great. Um, for you, Richard, you know, what is the biggest lesson you've learned in, in this business selling real estate? Um, I, I think the biggest lesson, it's, it's sort of abstract. I think that you, you know, it sounds, it sounds almost silly to say it, but I think you really have to focus on what's best for your client. And if you do that, then you're going to get good results. So what I mean by that is twofold. Not only do you want your clients to be happy and give you a positive online review, because in my business, it's very important. You know, we get a lot of leads from our online sources. So, you know, how can I, you know, work with this client and make sure that not only they're happy, they're happy enough to give me a positive online review and a referral. But I think it also means that I think people can tell your intentions. If you go to someone from a place of, I need to make this sale because I don't have to, I don't need, I need to pay my rent next month or I really want to go on vacation, so I really need to make a couple sales so I can pay for that, I think people can feel that, and it's not going to lead to a good result. So, you know, we do seller meetings or buyer meetings where we tell people, you know what, I, I know you're going to hire me to sell your place, but I don't think it's the right move for you. I think hmm. you need to hold on to it. I think you need to come back to me in a year from now, or I think you need to look at something else, maybe a refinance. Um, and buyers, you know, we, we try to talk to buyers about, you know, not just let's buy this house, but why do you want to buy this house? You know, what's, tell me what your game plan is. So I'm working with a friend right now. He came to me to buy an expensive duplex, and I said, no. I said, write down what your game plan is for the next five or ten years. Because I've seen too many people buy something, and then they have kids, or their life circumstance changes, and they have a property that's not really working for them. So tell me what your game plan is, and when, from there, let's backtrack and figure out what do you want to buy today. And that might be nothing. Well, so when I, people feel that you really care about them, then they're going to respect that, and they're going to want to work with you. I love that servant attitude. Uh, tell us one thing that's working for you in your business right now. Um, one thing that's working, it's a good question. Um, I, think, I, I think it all has to come down to lead generation and lead follow-up. I don't think there's anything else that's more important. So, you know, if someone calls in off our, our internet leads, we want to get back to them right away. Obviously, you know all the stats, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, the lead's probably dead after that. So if we get a contact, I want to make sure if it's not me that someone on the sales team is going to get back to them right away. Um, and then, you know, consistently following up with people and making sure, you know, they want to see property next week. Okay, let's make that showing. Let's follow up with them, make sure we have enough properties to show them, make sure they haven't changed their mind about what they want to see, and, and then go out and do it. You know, one, one reason uh, we were talking earlier before we got on this or started recording this, um, you are very uh, social media savvy. You, you have a blog that you're very regular with that I'm not mm-hmm. seeing with other super agents and, and particularly older folks. Um, mm-hmm. They're not doing that. Um, you, yeah. are, uh, you're, you are a Zillow premier agent. You're, you're on Trulia. Talk to us a little bit about uh, Zillow and Trulia, um, and uh, your experience with that. What do you What do you do specifically on Zillow, and how has that How has that helped uh, helped you? We uh, We buy ad space from Zillow and Trulia, Realtor. dot com, um, and I think a few others. Um, so you know, we pay them monthly fees 
for advertising. Um, we're pretty consistent about, you know, quarterly looking and seeing, okay, are we getting, you know, not, not just sales, but are we getting contacts? Because we know that a sales cycle for an internet lead could be six to 24 months. And we've, you know, mm. we routinely have closings that are, you know, this was a contact 18 months ago who disappeared for a year and then pops up, but they're in our lead generation system. So we continue to, you know, interact with them. So, you know, we buy ad space from them. It's not for everyone. You know, everyone asks me, oh, should I just go buy? Just going and buying ad space is not going to help you because then you have a bunch of leads and you have to know what to do with it. So if, if you're an independent agent, I think it's really hard for someone to take on 30 or 40 leads a month from a small internet account and follow up with those for 12, 18 months to, you know, to get closing. And we're seeing on our internet sources maybe 4 or 5% of the leads closed. So hmm. you have to really follow up with 20 people to get one closing. So... Uh, um is it worth it? I mean, uh, that sounds. I mean, that hit rate is really low. It's really low. I, well, you know, that's that's for the LA area. I've talked to a lot of my account reps at different vendors um, for these types of things, and they tell us that they're routinely seeing much lower hit rates in Los Angeles, and I think other high-priced areas as well. I think if you're in other parts of the country, you'll see probably double or triple that. But I think it's for the higher-priced area where there's more agent competition. I think that's probably common. But you know, it is worth it. Um, you know, getting a sale is so important because each sale leads to a positive customer experience, which leads to a positive online review, which generates another sale, or that sale generates a referral, or they buy something and then they sell it later. So you know, even if we're let's say cash flow neutral on a lead. Um, I don't think that we ever really are, but let's say even if we're not even making money, it's so great to have a closed sale because we have you know tons of examples of where one happy customer led to three or four other customers. And what my favorite is I met a guy at an open house one time, and between him and all of his referrals, I think we probably did 12 or 13 sales. Mm-hmm. And that, that's still 12 or 13 people who are our clients now who have houses that they might want to sell or they might want to buy in the future. So it was... You know, we, we love to, to get a good reaction like that that will lead to great results in the future. Got it. So uh, so as I mentioned earlier, so you are very active on social media. So Facebook, Twitter. Um, how do you utilize uh, those those platforms? Let's, let's talk about, well, I'm sure, well, go ahead. For, for me, Facebook, let's talk about, for Facebook specifically, Facebook, we really just use that to, to market to our sphere of influence. We're not, we don't have a ton of, you know, people that we don't know who are our friends or liking our professional page. So we really use that just to remind our sphere of influence. Um, and for me, I have, you know, 1,000, 1,100 Facebook friends. Just to remind them what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And I get a lot of business from that group of people. So it's very important to me. Um, you know, same thing with a lot of the other social media is really geared towards just um, mining and solidifying our, our current database of clients. So that's, that's really crucial. Stuff like the Yelp and the blogs on the website and the blogs on Zillow and Trulia when you go on and do comments there, that's really to draw in new clients. So we get a lot of hits on our website from our blogs or our postings, and then people call in uh, to act as a question. Sometimes they're just asking a question. They have no interest in buying, but we, you know, we answer. We try to give them the best information that we can because you never know if they're going to be a future client or not. So um, we, we, we have sort of two different models of uh, social media for us. Yeah, so uh, if I look at so you just mentioned something uh, kind of interesting. So uh, you, you're getting a four to five percent uh, close rate on Zillow, uh, but from your blog, you're also getting inbounds from your blog. What 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 kind of inbounds are you? I mean, what, what's the volume there, and what's the what's the closing ratio or rate you think uh, with that? Um, that one's harder to track because we we do get a fair number of people who aren't really buying or selling anything. They may have a question. Sometimes they're out of area. Um, we did a posting on HARP and HAMP loans last year, and I got probably 30 or 40 calls and emails. I don't think any of the people were local. Um, hmm. So it's hard to, hard to say on those. Um, that was just a very odd one where we got a lot of out-of-state, out-of-area inquiries. Um, generally, I think we try to, you know, if I get a, a personal referral, our close rate could be 75%. Hmm. Uh, but on our, on our other things, I think overall, um, we probably would have somewhere in the eight to twelve percent closing rate, which I think is excellent. I, I do too. All right, Richard. Well, we're at, at Ask the Agent Round, and this is where I fire off questions, and you come back at us with answers that will help each of us move the needle in our businesses. If you could recommend only one book, what would it be? Uh, I lo- I love the uh, the One Thing book. If you're if you're a new agent 
or any, anything, in, any professional, the one thing booked by Gary Keller is really fantastic. Got it. Do you have an internet tool like an Evernote that you're in love with that you can share with the audience? Um, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on Top Producer, which mm-hmm. is uh, probably nothing groundbreaking for you or your audience, but uh, for me, it's, it's sort of the most important. If, I, if you don't like that answer, I would say just our, our Google suite of products, which is all free, because of our team and our just, you know, we're all over the place geographically, um, Google Calendar, Google Drive, um, all that's very useful for synchronizing our team together. I agree. Do you personally have any, do you have any personal habits that uh, you feel have contributed to your success? Um, just hard work and follow up. I mean, if, if you have, if you don't have those, then it's not the right business for you. And, and, you know, being an entrepreneur or small business owner is not for you either. What are the first three steps a new agent should do to begin building his business in the next 10 days? Um, data, uh, sphere of influence, sphere of influence and market knowledge. Got it. Well, give us and one. And fourth would be sphere of influence. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, give us one piece of parting advice and let us know where we can find you and we'll sign off. Um, I, I think the best advice I mentioned before is it, you, you really have to care about your clients. If you don't care about your clients genuinely, um, I think, I think it'll be hard ultimately to build a large business uh, or even a medium sized business. I mean, you can always make a few sales, but, um, you know, you have to, you have to really find out what's the best for your clients and they'll respect that and, and you'll feel good about it too. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can feel free to reach out to me. My website's richardshulman.com and Shulman's S C H U L M A N. And all my contact info is on there. You can email me or call me from there. Well, and for everybody out there, you should know that uh, if you want to find this, you can just go to superagentslive.com slash Richard Shulman, S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N. Well, Richard, thank you so much for coming on. You, you, this was chock full of actionable advice. Um, we'll see you soon. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. Well, you heard it, folks. That was Richard Shulman. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that interview. The, there was really a lots of actionable advice there. But as a recap, here's some of them. As you heard, really, you guys should focus, according to Richard, on your sphere of influence. Focus on two to diff- three different types of lead gen, not 10 or 12. And it's important to be conversant with your market, what's selling, what's not, as well as how the economy is affecting the local real estate market. Get a mentor or coach. Richard says that he has three people he speaks with, and, he's, and that's helpful because when you're working in your business, it's hard to step back and see what's working and what's not. And lastly, it's not about the money. It's about your why. Richard suggests you find out the why, why you are in this business, as well as your c- customer. Why do they want to buy or sell and have a servant attitude? You know, I hope that you can take one thing away from this interview and implement it in your business today. If you've enjoyed this session as much as I have, please go to iTunes, subscribe, and give us a rating and review. I keep saying it, but those ratings and reviews will help us get featured in iTunes and help us grow this audience. So if you want to continue getting these free coaching sessions, take two or three minutes. Go to iTunes and do that for us, please. And by the way, if you do give us a five-star rating, we'll give you a shout-out on an upcoming episode. So until next time. I'm Toby Salgado, and I personally thank you for listening to Super Agents Live. Let's go!